Let me be one of the first to welcome you to the new season of autumn. It starts today. So you can enjoy all the pumpkin spice, everything you want without guilty feelings because you're now in the zone. Autumn has arrived. As uh, Brother Steve mentioned, we're in the midst of a short study of the great Christological passages in the book of Titus. Titus was written way toward the end of the Apostle Paul's life, and he was in a very, very tough church situation, as we'll see in just a few minutes. But in the midst of all of this, grand theology surfaced three times. The beginning of chapter 1, the end of chapter 2, and in the middle of chapter 3, which we'll look at next week, Lord willing. But before all that happens, let's have a word of prayer, and then we can approach the word of truth, which is the gospel of our salvation, as the book of Ephesians and Colossians state. So let us pray. Father, we rejoice to know that you are the God who does all things well. We have a high, holy, and heavenly calling, according to the Hebrew epistle. And we want to thank you so much that we are seated not only in the heavens, but also in Christ Jesus himself. We thank you for the indwelling spirit, as well as the uh, indwelling word of God that has made us wise into salvation. We would ask as well that it would make us wise unto sanctification. So we would ask, as Paul prayed in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, let your word run very quickly and be glorified in our midst. For this and many blessings that also fall from heaven above, we thank you in the precious and peerless name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, and now we pray in his holy name. Amen. It was May 1977, I just got my degree from Dallas Seminary, and the very next month I started as a full-time faculty member at Detroit Bible College hauling in a magnificent $9,000 a year. A year, nine grand a year was my starting salary. I actually wanted to be more of a pastor than a professor, but because I was single, that is not married, all the churches that I applied to while I was a senior in seminary, I did not get one phone call, not one postcard, not anything, because I guess they didn't want a church with a unmarried, that is a single pastor. But Detroit Bible College said, maybe we can nab Greg for nine grand. And I'm sure, I'm sure he'll be happy, and most certainly I was. I enjoyed thoroughly my years on the faculty at Detroit Bible College. After a few years, the academic dean called me in unexpectedly and you know, said, uh, Greg, I want to talk to you. Something important has happened. And I said, okay. And I walked in and he said, I, I want you to know, Greg, we're, we're going to give you a promotion. You're no longer an instructor. You're an assistant professor of Bible and theology. And I said, well, thank you for that unexpected promotion. How much more money will I get because of it? And Dr. Woodbird said, not a penny. <laughs> so I guess you'd call that a lateral promotion. But the idea of being uh, an instructor uh, to an assistant professor, then you go to associate professor, then you go to full professor, then you become a distinguished professor, that's just how you make your way up the academic chain. But today we're going to be talking about a professor, and his, the professor's name is Grace, <laughs> Grace, but you could also call him the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The class that we are in would be called Orthodoxy and Orthopraxy 101. Orthodoxy, we must believe correctly. Orthopraxy, we must live correctly. And the first yields the second. And we're not only in Orthodoxy and Orpraxy 101 taught by the professor, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not class 101, it's more like one million and one. In other words, we just keep taking this class over and over again, and it seems like we can never get out of it. The classroom that is the campus is quite large. It's the whole wide world. It's a local church, and it's also your family unit. 
because you have to glow brightly in all three areas so that your light might glorify Jesus Christ. The length of the degree program, it's not a four-year bachelor or like Pastor Steve and I, a four-year master. It's not any kind of grad school. The length of the degree program is every single day of your life. Every single day of your life. And when you have your graduation exercise, it's one nanosecond before you die. But then, the graduation party, the open house, and its venue is indescribable. It is heaven. It's in the presence of Christ. So as we approach uh, Titus chapter 2, we'll take the last part of verse 10 and go all the way down to verse 15. We're going to see how Professor Grace, that is Professor Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, can work in our life, take us from unbelievable sin to unbelievable holiness, and it just has a flow. It has a cadence that as we look at these verses, and some of you might even memorize them or have already, it's just so beautiful. There's so much theology stuffed into this paragraph that you just know for certain that God has written the Bible and this paragraph specifically. Even the Apostle Paul, with his PhD in rabbinical theology, brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, he couldn't even compose this on his own unless it was for the full inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to, going to develop uh, a quartet of things this morning. First of all, the epiphany, which here I'll translate it as the word appearance. The epiphany of grace. The grace of God is going to appear. That's the epiphany of grace. Then secondly, we're going to have the education of grace. That is, Jesus wants to instruct, teach, and most especially, indoctrinate you into his divine truth. Then we'll move thirdly to the epiphany of glory, that is the appearance of glory, because he doesn't want you to struggle your whole life. He wants to give you a new body, a body incapable of sinning. And he will do that at the rapture of the church, which would be the epiphany or the appearance of glory. And then lastly, because good doctrine always results in good living, we're going to have at verse 15 the experience of grace. In other words, if Jesus Christ did everything the way he was supposed to do in his person and his work, and by the way he did, then we should be able to have revolutionary and radical lives as this grace can so change us that we would bear fruit that abounds and fruit that abides. But first things first, we are at Titus chapter 2, looking at the end of verse 10, all of verse 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, as we make our way through this famous and very Christological, that is Christ-centered, portion of the Word of God. So let's put on our theological thinking caps and make our way through these important verses. First of all, the epiphany or the appearance of grace. When something new, something bright, something fresh comes into your mind, you might say, I, I had an epiphany last night. In other words, something came, it appeared, it arrived, and it's so revolutionary that you want to share it with somebody else. And that's what's happening here at the end of verse number 10 and the beginning of verse number 11. Verse number 10 ends that they may adorn, adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. So we are to adorn. This is actually the Greek noun cosmos, or the Greek verb cosmeo. But from this word, we get our word cosmetics, because the word cosmos means a structured order of things. And cosmetics are to make your face structured and ordered. 
And that's where our word cosmetics comes from. So we are to be a cosmetic that adorns the very doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. In other words, your life better make Jesus Christ look beautiful. Your life must make God the Father look glorious. Now, when Paul was on the island of Crete, it was a tough, tough work. In fact, Titus was there to do the tough work. I'm just going to go to chapter 1 and a little bit in chapter 2 and show you the raw materials that Titus had to work with as a pastor on the island of Crete. It, these will be close to 20, and they'll be very, very fast. But I just want you to get a feeling of what the, what the, the, the Cretans were like. For example, at Titus chapter 1, verse 10, rebellious, empty talkers, deceivers, verse 11, teachers of things they shouldn't ought to teach, verse 12, they're liars, they're evil beasts, and there's lazy gluttons. Verse 14 says, they are men who turn away from the truth, and the next verse says, they are defiled, they are unbelieving. Verse 16, they deny Christ, they're detestable, they're disobedient, and they're worthless for every good deed. Yeah, chapter 2, verse 3, they're malicious gossips, and they are enslaved to much wine. Down at verse number 9, they are argumentative, and here we are at verse number 10, not pilfering, that is, they were thieves. Almost 20 of these characteristics that I've just described hopefully don't describe you. This is your B.C. life before Christ. But it's that kind of situation in which you really need the grace of God to appear in your life. And that's exactly what happened. In the Greek language, there is a verb called Corinthiazomai, which means I play the part of a Corinthian that is, I'm immoral. I'm immoral. And then the other word would be the word Cretan. If you live on the island of Crete, you probably live like those 20 traits I just described, and you are a Cretan. So here in 2024, if someone calls you a Cretan, that is not a good thing. That is an insult. So the two, one says, worst churches around were Corinth and those who inhabited the island of Crete. And guess whom Paul sent to both cities to labor? A spiritual marine, a spiritual special op, a spiritual seal by the name of Titus. If anybody could make it work, it would be Titus. Because he works best in the trenches, and he works best when the bullets are ablazon. So Paul is telling Titus at the end of chapter 2, you must preach the word to the point where there's going to be an epiphany or there's going to be an appearance of grace. Negatively, we have just seen how bad they were at chapter 1 and chapter 2 as it began. And if you're that bad, you really need a Savior. You really need a God. You really need the grace of God. And that's what we get at our very next verse, which is verse 11. So the epiphany of grace negatively you need it because all of the sin at chapters 1 and 2. But positively, positively, at verse number 11, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation. If you live like chapters 1 and 2, you need salvation. If you live like chapters 1 and 2, you need the grace of God. And beloved, we all do. So looking at verse number 11, the Bible says, For the grace of God has appeared. And of course, theologians debate what this means. Is the grace of God like the divine attribute of grace? Is it grace incarnate? Like at 1 Timothy 1.1, we have the beautiful expression, Christ Jesus, our hope. Isn't that a beautiful verse 
1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Christ Jesus, our hope. Or in this case, the grace of God equals Christ Jesus. So it could be that way. It could be a divine attribute. It could be more of an equal sign. I like to call him Professor Jesus because he personifies grace. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth were incarnate in Jesus Christ at John 1.17. So here we have the grace of God, and it has appeared. It appeared, first of all, at Bethlehem when Jesus was born. It last appeared on earth at Bethany, at the site of the Ascension. And everywhere in between, from Bethlehem to Bethany, Jesus Christ was God's grace personified, and he did nothing but live a perfect life that was full of grace. And the Apostle Paul, meditating on that, wrote verses like 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. Our Savior Christ Jesus appeared, that's our word, to abolish death. And he brought light and immortality to light through the gospel. What a beautiful verse. And that is exactly what happens here at the beginning of Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Jesus Christ, the very personified grace of God, has appeared and he's brought salvation to all men. Bringing salvation. Well, we just met at the end of chapter 2, God our Savior. Here at verse 11, He's bringing salvation. In a little bit, we're going to see that Jesus Christ is our Savior. So it seems as life, God is the Savior. The Son is the Savior. They're bringing salvation. It seems like God is interested in your soul, in your eternal soul, and what theologians call you, your immaterial nature. This is your material nature, flesh, body, but you have an immaterial nature, like a soul, a spirit, a conscience. And God is interested deeply in those kind of things. So this grace of God, who is Jesus Christ, has brought salvation at the cross to all men. That is, in my theology, every person is rendered savable. In other words, the incarnation of Christ, his perfect life and his impeccable death has rendered, as C.S. Lewis would say in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, if you are a daughter of Eve or a son of Adam, you are rendered savable because of this miraculous death of Jesus Christ who brought salvation to all featherless bipeds. Human beings, homo sapiens, those made in his image and can be redeemed by his blood. And that's the kind of Bible and salvation you want. So the epiphany or the appearance of grace, negatively, man, we are really sinners. Positively, we have God our Savior, Christ our Savior, that wants to bring salvation right to the door of our hearts. But there's more. There's not only the epiphany or the appearance of grace, but now secondly, secondly, there is the education of grace. The education of grace, and that's found at verse 12. And once again, we'll say something negative and something positive. But verse number 12 begins with that word, instructing us. In other words, grace, that is Christ, is an instructor, a teacher, a professor. And one thing that is on every page of the divine syllable, syllabus is this. First of all, it's negative. We deny ungodliness and worldly desires. But then we're also instructed to be very, very positive. That is Christ-like, seen in words like living sensibly, righteously, and godly. So that grace that brings salvation, that's what God does. But now the education of grace 
denying ungodliness and worldly desires. That's what we do as born-again people, living soberly, righteously, and godly. That's what we do as born-again people because the grace of God, the grace of Christ, is a wonderful instructor, teacher, and professor. And first of all, he says to deny ungodliness, or maybe a bit more accurate in the Greek text, having denied ungodliness, having denied worldly desires, now we're well on the road to live sensibly, righteously, and godly. So here we are, we are to deny ungodliness. But Pastor Hans, I never wanted to deny myself. I want to do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, with whatever I have to do it with. I said, okay, you will never mature. You will never grow. You'll be in spiritual pampers for the rest of your life. Because it takes spiritual maturity of a God-taught grace to say no, that is to deny ungodliness. It's hard to do because Hebrews 11 says that most people, listen closely, enjoy, I like that word, the pleasures, I like that word, of sin. Uh, I, I don't like that word, but I like doing it. Because sin is fun. We enjoy the pleasure of sin. And that's why people don't want to stop doing it. It's too much fun. It's enjoyable. Well, the only way I would change my mind in reference to that would be, I guess I'd have to be born again. Plus, I'd have to be indoctrinated by grace, because that's not in me. Jesus says, you get an A on that quiz. You have answered correctly. You deny ungodliness, and then secondly, you deny worldly desires, worldly desires. Just listen to Mark 4.19. Mark 4.19 is a parable. And at Mark 4.19, Jesus says three things are going to choke the word of God as you would see choking maybe in an Agatha Christie book. I'm talking about literal choking the life out of someone. Now spiritually, Mark 4.19 First of all, it's the worries of this world or the cares of this age, depending on what your translation is. The worries and cares of this age. Secondly, the deceitfulness of riches. Money talks. It says goodbye. It's in your wallet and your purse only for a short amount of time. Thirdly, the desire for many things. That is, the desire to keep up with the Joneses. So if you want to have a stifled life, being in a spiritual coma, then just have the worries of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire to keep up with the Joneses, you'll be spiritually worthless. So I want you to deny ungodliness. I want you to deny worldly desires. And since you'll have so much extra time, Let's fill these two voids with something that is positive. We've seen the negative. Now three things that are positive. First, we want to live sensibly. Secondly, we want to live righteously. And thirdly, we want to live godly. I'm reading, of course, the end of the book of Titus at chapter 2, verse 12. These three adverbs, sensibly, righteously, and godly. First, we want to live sensibly. In other words, we want control, not self-control. We want a well-ordered life. We want sound judgment. We want to be prudent. That used to be a woman's first name, prudence. You don't hear that much anymore unless you came on the Mayflower. But a great, great name. So if you want to live sensibly, self-mastery, well-ordered life, prudence, it seems as if that people and things, that is people, things, and circumstances, are not the rudder and tiller of your life. Because you are better than that. Grace has made you better than that. 
and you want to live sensibly as you live your own life. But secondly, you're to live righteously, that is, before other people, in the presence of other people, you want to be a righteous person who conforms to God's biblical standards. You want to have a Micah chapter 6, verse 8 kind of life. What does the Lord require of you? First of all, love mercy. Second of all, here it is, do justly. Thirdly, walk humbly with your God, that beautiful verse, Micah 6, 8. But to do justly toward others. People will say, you're a righteous dude. You're honest, you're fair, you're square. You not only do what's expected, you do that plus a little bit more. You're righteous. You're, you're good. And that is a spiritual compliment. And then the third thing is to live godly. Godliness, how about God-likeness? Christ-likeness, God-likeness or godliness, that's how verse number 12 ends. We have a, a, a devotion to God. We have a sensitivity that we don't want to offend God with our sin. And, and we know when to be quiet, and we know when to erupt in praise. We, we live godly. Now, in my life as a minister of the gospel, I've always tried to look at the Christian life inwardly, outwardly, and upwardly. That's just one little quirk I have as a minister. But when I look at these three adverbs, sensibly, righteously, godly, sensibility, that's me internally. This is how I want to live. Righteously, that's outwardly to you. And then godly, that's upward toward God. And isn't that a great way to balance the Christian life? Not by the beloved and late Dr. Charles Rolls Ryrie's book by the same name, Balancing Your Christian Life. But no, every day, feed your own soul. Meet or try to bless a saved or a lost person outwardly and make sure that God is in your mind. God is in your heart. And do this, the Bible says, in the present age. The now time. The very first sentence Paul ever wrote was a long one. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. It's a long verse, or a long sentence. And in it, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus Christ died and rose again in order that, here it is, he might deliver us from this present evil age. Well, this present evil age at Galatians 1, 4 equals in the present age, in the now age that ends verse 12. And so right now, if we want to be sensible, righteous, and godly, we're going to do that by being different than the world that wants to bring us down. This world is cursed. Our salvation brings us upward. So, we've had the epiphany or the appearance of grace. Secondly, we've seen the education of grace. Now, thirdly, now thirdly, the epiphany or appearance of glory. We shift from grace to glory. The epiphany or the appearance of glory, verses 13 and 14. These are very famous verses. If you have to memorize a couple before you die, you couldn't do much better than these two. Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. So we want to note in these two verses, three things. First, the Christian's perception. Secondly, Christ's person. And lastly, Christ's work. But first of all, let's look at the Christian's perception that begins verse 13. We look for the blessed hope. Our perception, our hope, our anticipation, our expectation, our longing is for this kind of a blessed hope, a blessed hope. And I am one of the millions who look at that and say that must be the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. I am looking, anticipating, yearning for a blessed hope. 
I don't want to wait till the middle of the tribulation. That's a mid-trib rapture. I don't want to wait till the end of the tribulation. That's a post-trib rapture. I don't want a partial rapture where the good Christians go and the carnal worldly backslid and stay in the tribulation just to teach them a lesson. I don't want a partial rapture either. I want a blessed hope. I want an imminent coming of my Savior. I'm asked, Greg, is Jesus Christ coming soon? And I always answer this way. Jesus Christ is coming next, not necessarily soon. He is coming next in that there is no piece of prophetic literature that needs to be fulfilled before Jesus Christ comes back. He can come back at any time. It's imminent. And that's the blessed hope that I have. If I have to wait for all the dominoes to fall, then that's not as blessed as the pre-trib rapture. So my, my perception is of a blessed hope. And I say that because the next thing is Christ's person. Yes, I get a blessed hope, but it's based on the person and work of Christ. So let's look at the person and work of Christ. First, his person. The appearing, verse 13, of the glory of, here it is, our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Or maybe a little better, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, who is Christ Jesus. So it's not our great God and Savior is the Father. And secondly, there's Christ Jesus. No. This is a clear verse of the deity of Christ. Our great God and Savior equals Christ Jesus. And if he's a great God and Savior, man, oh man, I'm in a good place. He's the great God and Savior. And certainly the problems that I have in my life, he easily can handle. Plus, as a Savior, all those sins of Titus chapters 1 and 2, no problem at all for the blood of Christ. So I'm waiting for the glory, or the appearing of the glory. Again, it can be translated, uh, waiting for the appearing of the glory, or in the King James, the glory is appearing. It can work either way grammatically. A woman of beauty is a beautiful woman. A man of wisdom is a wise man. A man of God is a godly man. And the glory is appearing could be the appearing of the glory. So it works either way, but that's our blessed hope. There's a glorious return, uh, and that return can come at any time. That's Christ's person, deity enfleshed, a great God who is our Savior. But there's something said in addition to that, which is his work. And his work begins at verse number 14. And this great God who is our Savior at verse number 14 had a great work on the cross. Verse 14 begins, who gave himself for us to redeem us. He gave himself for us, that's Jesus as Savior, to redeem us, obviously that's Jesus as Redeemer. So I have a great God who's deity, who's also a savior, who's also a redeemer. I sort of like the person and work of Christ. His person is so perfect that his work has so much impact. It's of the divine plan of God. And does that great God, who is a savior and a redeemer, who gave himself for me, will that ever trickle down into my daily life? And the answer is yes, because Christ's work is first of all seen in the negative fashion. He's redeemed us from every lawless deed. Yeah, that's Titus chapters 1 and 2. There's a whole bunch of lawless deeds. And Christ's death kind of specializes in redeeming and saving and rescuing and delivering people 
who are trapped, bound, and just gang-tackled by sin. He's the Redeemer. He's God. He can get you out of that. So negatively, his redemption keeps you from every lawless deed. But positively, positively, at the middle of this verse 14, he wants to purify for himself a people for his own who are zealous of good works. So at the end of verse number 14, he wants to purify or make for himself his own possession. You are possessed by Jesus Christ. You are created and redeemed by Christ Jesus. You are saved and owned as a possession by the redemption of Christ. And that, beloved, is extremely positive and powerful. Not only are you getting rid of lawless deeds, but now you can be zealous for good works because you have been purified to be his own very personal possession, if I make that a little bit more detailed. In other words, Jesus Christ is your God, your Savior, your Redeemer, and your Creator. He's created you as a possession. All possessions need a Creator. Jesus says, I'm that. He says, you're lucky. I'm God. I'm Savior, I'm Redeemer, I'm Creator. What a blessed quartet. What a blessed theological truth that these roles and positions of our Savior are for us who believe. And for that reason, we are to be zealous for good works. Like countless thousands, my favorite movie is the Wizard of Oz. And way at the end, when the wizard wants to reward those three individuals, when he comes to the Tin Man, the Wizard of Oz just can't get out the word philanthropist. He tries and tries and tries, and then he gives up and says, you're, you're a good deed-doer. You're a good deed-doer. To be zealous for good deeds, I guess I'm to be a good deed doer. But not only that, I'm to be zealous. I'm to be a zealot for Christ, sowing spiritual seeds of good deeds. So, wow, again, doctrine yields this change of our lives if we understand salvation correctly. So as we begin our exit, as we begin our descent, We've been with the epiphany of grace, the education of grace, the epiphany of glory, and now lastly, the experience of grace. The experience of grace. Just verse number 15. Positively, these things speak and these things exhort. And the, the Greek words here are not speak, preach the gospel. This is just in your everyday life, speak, encourage people, by saying, you have a Savior and a Redeemer and a Creator who's God. And if that does not encourage you, then probably nothing else will. So we want to be a spiritual good deed doer by sharing out of our mouth at frequent occasions how wonderful and glorious our Savior and salvation is. And then Paul will say to Titus at the middle of verse 15, somewhat negatively, Pastor Titus, reprove these truths with all authority. In other words, those Cretans aren't going to like what you're going to say because they love their sin. But you have to preach the truth. You have to reprove them with all authority. The church in which Steve Baker and I grew up in here in America, the pastor every now and then would say, as a pastor, I can shear you many times, but I can only skin you once. <laughs> Pastors are to be shearers, not butchers. The wool needs to be shorn, but 
the sheep and lamb have to be alive, they have to be saved. And again, Paul speaking to Titus, the spiritual marine, you reprove, you tell these sinners what's happening with all authority. Book, chapter, verse, exposition, systematic theology, personal application. Then lastly, and let, by the way, let no man disregard you. Let no man tease you. Let no man say, oh, you're a religious person. Of course you think that way, but you really don't know what fun is. You don't really know what pleasure is. You don't really know what joy is. Because Hebrews 11 says that I can enjoy the pleasure of sin, something you'll never know because you want to be holy. Let him talk like that till the cows come in. The most joyous person you'll ever meet is a godly saint of the Most High God. Because with salvation comes that joy that's inexpressible. So to exit on this Sunday afternoon, if you are here without knowledge of God, I have good news for you. Because verse 10 says that God wants to be your Savior. Verse 13 says that Jesus wants to be your Savior. Verse 11 says they're bringing salvation to the very doorstep of your heart. Plus, not only is he a Savior and a Redeemer, he's also the Creator God. So you have a lot going for you if you will just believe in the truth of the Bible, not the reality of sin that weighs you down in its deadly clutches. But to the saved, I would give you this encouragement. Because you have a Savior, because you have a Redeemer, because you have a Creator God, then it would only make sense that negatively, you would say no to ungodliness, worldliness, and lawlessness, verses 12 and 14, and say yes to living sensibly, righteously, and godly. That's verse 12. And when you do this, you will be passionate to do good works. And when you do that, you automatically go to where we started. You will adorn. You will make beautiful. You will make such a, a, a beautiful statement about the God of your salvation that people will marvel that you spend time with Jesus. Isn't Titus 2 a great way to end Titus 2? This Christological passage of the person and work of Christ, the reality of sin, the demands and the victories and the grace of holiness, it's within our grasp. It's in the theological wheelhouse of deity and the Bible. So let's carry it to the furthest extent. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the word of God, the word of truth. Thank you for this church, which by the decade has unashamedly preached Christ and him crucified. So might this day and next Sunday be no different when we see Jesus Christ high and lifted up and to see him as our good, great, and chief shepherd because we pray in his name and for his namesake. Amen.